All right, so what are we covering today? So we're going to be discussing uh, the why modernize and covering platforms like IBM Mainframe DB2, Netiza, and Informix. We'll be touching on some use cases for Lakehouse architecture. We'll speak to why we think modernization is hard. We'll cover some modernization strategies in relation to data stage ETL and stored procedure modernization. We're going to talk about the CDC role in relation to migrations and ongoing replications with platforms like IBM Mainframe. And then after all these topics are covered, we're going to be showing a live demo of real-time CDC from an IBM DB2 database to a Databricks Lakehouse. And then finally, we're going to wrap up in proper style a little, with a little Q&A session. All right. So today, our presenters will be Soham Bhatt and Raj Sen. Soham leads the data warehouse migration practice at Databricks. Previously, Soham has spent a significant amount of time as an enterprise data warehouse and big data architect at popular companies like Toyota Motors, State Street, CVS Caremark, and Hewlett Packard. Raj is the founder and CTO of Archeon Labs. Raj has spent 15 years building database products at, at well-known companies like Oracle, SAP, Sybase. Raj has also published at least a dozen research papers for, for top tier publications and journals, database publications and journals to be specific, which have been cited by more than a thousand papers. So with our agenda set and our speakers introduced, I'd like to pass the floor over to Soham. So let me stop sharing. Thank you, Luke. <clears throat> So um, first of all, uh, hello everyone, and thank you um, Archeon Labs for giving me the opportunity to speak um, at this event. I hope you all can see my screen. Let's get started. So IBM, right? Tremendous respect, obviously, for the company. They all, I mean, especially EF card, right? Invented the, the relational database model, second normal form, third normal form, all the good stuff, right? Which was later then we went into analytics and then Kimball and Bill Inman and they all took it further uh, with dimensional models and, and, and so on. But uh, if you quickly look at the I, I, IBM's journey, right? Obviously DB2 mainframes, um, DB2 was super popular uh, in the nineties, uh, mainframes obviously in the eighties and nineties and then one of my favorite software, um, um, IBM, uh, like Netiza, IBM acquired it in 2010, TwinFin appliance, um, MPP architecture, um, right? So we all know um, that IBM back in the 80s, 90s, and even early to, uh, early 2000s was uh, very, very uh, prevalent, right? Now, what we started seeing in probably 2010 plus, right, is as like internet started becoming more and more popular, uh, people started like we started getting different kind of data, streaming data, unstructured data feeds started coming in. Uh, previously, people were fine just doing historical reporting, but the need for agility came into picture, right? People wanted to do real time analytics. Uh, people wanted to do ML and EI and also on-prem data warehouses and mainframe, they were not able to keep up. Just scaling was an issue. Giant on-prem data centers, you need a lot of people to maintain the rack and stack and the networking equipments and so on. And just to procure and add capacity was uh, a time consuming and very costly task, right? So we started seeing a trend uh, of, of people thinking of modernization, right? On, um, we also learned, right, Natiza is now end of life. Um, um, I think 2010 or so it was announced. Uh, the effective date is coming up next year. And so I think everyone, most of the customers I talk to in our migration business at Databricks are trying to like, you know, think about how to modernize and how to migrate data off of Natiza. So in this webinar, Raj will show us uh, some patterns. Um, Customers also, right, a lot of people from, from Netiza on-prem, they also went to IBM uh, a cloud pack for data. For a while, there was some confusion. A lot of people even went to Sailfish, which was DB2 data warehouse for cloud. I don't think that really saw a lot of adoption, but uh, there is DB2 warehouse, there's IBM cloud pack. But I think at this point, companies need to 
take a stock of the data systems and think about like if you're modernizing to the cloud, right? You have options. Cloud is all about picking the best tool, right tool for the right job, right? It's not that you buy something, a perpetual license or a multi-year license and you're stuck with it. So there is a lot of flexibility in the cloud charging model. We charge by the minute, most of the cloud technology. So there is a lot of, uh, lot of options, right? So uh, you have to think about what's the technology which was built ground up from the cloud and it has separation of compute and storage so that you have infinite scalability and infinite scalability in storage as well as in 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 the in the compute side and can you shut off your data warehouses and data systems uh, by different teams or can it auto scale up auto scale down you have to think of all these things right and then if you're going to the cloud do you want to still like just go to one cloud or do you want do you have a multi cloud strategy right so all these questions come up as you think of modernizing your um, Netiza and IBM uh, options right so then the other question that will come up is do you want to go to yet another cloud data warehouse or do you want to consider and take this opportunity to because if you move your data to yet another cloud uh, EDW it's still EDW to EDW right you are just moving it to someone else's data center that's what cloud is it's just outsource data center. So are you just doing that or are you taking the opportunity to modernize your data architecture fundamentally to take advantage of the modern uh, Lakehouse platform? So what do I mean by that? What's Lakehouse, right? So as you can see in this data maturity curve, um, EDWs were relevant back in the day, decades ago, and all that mattered was financial reporting quarterly and you know historical reporting, get data in, Clients confirm to spend six months plus just doing data modeling. After that, load it. And then after one year or so, the business gets some nice dimensional model loaded, and then you do all your reporting. Well, in today's day and age, people want more agile approach, right? We everyone wants self-service analytics. They want to know, they want to do predictive prescriptive analytics. They want not nightly batch, but they want near near real time. Uh, or even real-time loads, especially when it is uh, uh, banking fraud detection or, or, or some patient uh, system uh, and, and someone's life is dependent on, on processing real-time data and so on, right? So people, all the tech leaders, all the innovators are moving to the right side of this data maturity curve, right? Uh, but it's a journey, right? You have all these 20, 30, 40 years of data platforms, it's IBM, Oracle, Teradata, et cetera. How do you modernize it, okay? Every CIO's vision, especially when I talk to companies doing cloud modernization, they want to genuinely enable self-service analytics and empower their business teams. They want IT teams to be enablers of innovation. They want IT teams to create platforms and onboarding guides and practices so that how to get data in easily and how they can empower business and cities and data scientists to do reporting and advanced analytics versus uh, maintaining 10 different data platforms, which are siloed, right? So if you want to do self-service analytics, break enterprise data silos, then you have to think of um, like how to do it. And most importantly, how to consolidate all your data um, into like a broader uh, enterprise data platform, right? Versus uh, versus data being in uh, different distributed data marts. And even though we call things enterprise data warehouse, in reality, people have marketing data warehouse, manufacturing data warehouse, financial data mart, right? That enterprise burst architecture concept of Kimball, very few companies have truly achieved it. And largely because conceptually we could do it. The problem is you are hitting the limits of the MPP architecture, they're very, very expensive. So no one is going to double, triple your Netiza or Teradata systems, especially when a lot of it is going end of life and so on, right? So even if you want to scale, you cannot scale. So I think I'm already getting into why this is difficult, right? It's simple to say, enable self-service analytics and do modern BI and AI on one platform. But like, what's the story? Why is it difficult? It's difficult because like genuinely life was easy. In the 90s, when I started my career, we had Oracle, IBM, DB2, Nagisa, et cetera, right? Take like any enterprise, right? And then they will have enterprise ETL tools. 
power center, IBM data stage, if you are a bank, maybe you have an issue and so on. And we were feeding an enterprise data warehouse, NetEase Teradata, and we will do BI reporting we, and we were all happy. Uh, obviously in 2005 plus, we all discovered that, you know what, this is not scalable. We have lots of data coming in. My EDW cannot handle it. So then came Hadoop and big data concept that, okay, let me use commodity hardware, put everything in and do um, um, easy like um, compute on it. And now thankfully you can handle unstructured data. You can do ML. And if you remember Hadoop, Mahout and so on, there were libraries that they were installing and started at least doing predictive uh, analytics and so on. But even that had a problem. It couldn't do acid compliance, terrible BI performance, right? Hadoop is actually dead, right? Because when we, when Databricks uh, uh, founders created Apache Spark, it was anyways 100 times faster than Hadoop. So Spark became de facto standard here, but open source Spark was still, um, right? It was still our data lake technology, right? So because of all these issues, people started moving to cloud data warehouses, right? Cloud came along and there were cloud data warehouses. Um, here, I mean, no, not a bad idea. At least you can scale. So what's the difference between on-prem data warehouses and cloud data warehouses? At least you can scale it effectively. There was a little bit of separation of compute and storage, not in every system, but in some systems. Uh, so scalability was solved, but the fact that you are still going to the 80s architecture if you are just doing cloud data warehousing, right? Because you cannot do ML, AI, cannot do streaming. So you still have a very siloed stack in terms of your platform. And then what you will do after that is like, okay, now let me copy data out again to some ML systems or maybe back to your data lake to do ML, AI, real time uh, stuff. And so more ETL, more movement of the data. At the end of the day, as a, and any big enterprise is moving terabyte, petabyte scale data from one place to another, right? So that's why ETL developers are always in high demand, right? Data engineering is the key. Um, uh, but if you, if you really think about it, when you move data out, you have egress charges, you don't have a single version of truth, and there is a lot of complexity. So, uh, I hope we had a question on this, but I think this is more or less something like this is the current state of an enterprise arch uh, architecture enterprise data platform, okay? So how to simplify this? Because what you see here is siloed stacks, siloed data governance model. Different teams have different access, right? Someone has to maintain their permissions to data. And then there is constant ETL. There is no single version of truth. How to simplify it? So we created this concept of lake house architecture, right? Now, what was that? It's a fundamentally different concept. The idea is get your data in a cloud storage, open source, don't lock your data into any proprietary technology. And once your data is in cloud storage, any cloud, first of all, don't even lock yourself on a single cloud, right? So use a technology that works on any cloud, open source, provide a nice governance layer on top of that with what we have is Unity Catalog. But more importantly, instead of data moving from one platform to another for different kind of compute, different compute engines are available within the same platform. And on the same copy, imagine you have a customer table, giant, right? You can do streaming into customer table, batch ETL if you want, multiple teams can do insert update, same file, it's it's a file at this point, okay? But it has all database-like capabilities like insert, update, merge, asset compliance. So if something fails, it rollbacks and so on. So all of that is possible. And you can even do data science and machine learning. So if there are 10 different Databricks cluster, they are, even if there are 10, we provide asset compliance uh, on, on that uh, customer table, like I said, and you can shut down three to four databases and even then your customer data is still there and so on, right? Fundamentally different idea, data doesn't move, compute comes to data, compute can scale up, scale down, and uh, right, you don't have to worry about the single version of truth issue at all. Um, and again, most important part, don't lock yourself in into any cloud, any proprietary ETL vendor, um, and, and uh, keep it all open source, right? And, and do BI and ML all in one platform. So that's Lakehouse architecture. Now, the modern data stick, uh, stack. 
So move your data from whether it's IBM, Natiza, right, Oracle, uh, etc. But for that, the number one thing you need first, right? Yes, you established uh, lake house architecture, but you need to do real time CDC out of it uh, and and start feeding your lake house architecture. So Archeon is a great fit. They are a great partner of ours. If you go to Databricks Partner Connect, you can see Archeon right there, and you can spin it up. You can use Archeon to directly ingest into Delta Lake format, or if you have, let's say, streaming architecture, you can do real-time CDC, feed your Confluent or Kafka topics, and then uh, further do ETL after it. Now, in Databricks, you can always use your favorite GUI-based ETL tool, such as Matillion, Prophecy, Informatica, if you want, or you can even do a streaming ETL in Databricks using Databricks uh, Delta Live Tables and uh, batch ETL using uh, Databricks Notebook, right? So that is your lot of options to do ETL. But the, the point is velocity. If Archeon is getting you data near real time into bronze, then bronze to silver, silver to gold can still happen in a SQL based streaming ETL way, real time data warehousing. Talking about it since the 90s, it re never really happened. It can finally happen with Archeon and Databricks. And then for consumption, you can use, you can connect your favorite uh, tool, Power BI, Tableau, Looker, et cetera, to Databricks SQL and do BI. And then using the same environment, you can do machine learning and AI, okay? Now, that was just the architecture and how to get data in. You have to think of mainframe migrations too. And a lot of time, mainframe, Mainframes are there for a different reason, right? The transactional, a lot of information like banks or credit card information in that. So you still want to get that data out, right? Like Cobalt copy books or Epsidic format data. Put it in your lake house. You can tie it with your other data systems, right? Because you're consolidating on a lake house. So you need to get your mainframe data there as well. So don't even try to do this by creating your own frameworks and uh, so on, because you, you have to really think here. Do you want your best engineers to just do production support and maintain all this real-time pipelines? Or do you want to like use a partner like Archeon who can get it done fully managed for you as a uh, cloud platform and have your best engineers do actual analytics and make sure they work on more business uh, projects that are delivering value and revenue for the company versus just maintaining infrastructure, right? So you can free up a lot of your infrastructure resources and they can do like much better value added stuff. So that's that. Now, uh, this is, this webinar is focused more on how to get your data into Databricks, but also know that there are data stage ETL, there is IBM, uh, sorry, there is Natiza and DB2 store procedures. So how do you modernize that? You can modernize that to Delta Live tables, Right, just go to databricks.com and read about Delta Live Tables. It's a fully managed ETL framework on Databricks. Or you can use Matillion, Prophecy, Informatica, et cetera, or DBT now to, to do your ETL on top of Databricks. And we even have partners like LeapLogic, BladeBridge, even Prophecy and Matillion can help to auto convert your, your stored procedures and data stage ETL. Uh, and with a click of a button, convert 80% or so. To, to Databricks Notebook. And we have a big SI partner uh, who are certified in this and they can like accelerate your migration and help you modernize uh, your data stage and these uh, uh, stored procedures. So quick example, here's a data stage mapping. Every link in data stage, we have tools that can convert it to Databricks uh, uh, SQL code, okay? It could be PySpark or Databricks SQL. So you're still, you can stick with NC SQL and get your migration done. So with that, let me hand it over to Raj and, and uh, let's uh, see a, a deeper dive into how to get data out of Natiza and mainframes into Databricks. Over to you, Raj. Thank you, Soham. Um, share my screen here. Thanks, Luke, for the um, you know kind introduction. Um, I hope everybody can uh, see my screen here. <clears throat> so Soham uh, brought about a great point, which is you know um, how do you make sure that you know you modernize your data stack and you can actually you know uh, use Lakehouse 
to not only you know create a platform where you unify your analytics but also i think one of the great one one you know thing that was covered was business decision making needs to shift to you know um, real time you know so <clears throat> i'll cover uh, one aspect of this which is very important which is data migration historically uh, data migration has been done using a batch based approach to, you know um, and this was easier to implement but with batch uh, one big challenge is you know on the you know a you are getting your data you know not in real time uh, you know so if the if a transaction has occurred or a change has occurred in the database you get it you know when the batch has been triggered right let's say 4 hour 8 hour or people do even 24 hour batch so that approach uh, right now uh, you know is is something that you know doesn't fit into the modern uh, architecture very well because you want data to you know to be real time data to be fresh and accurate so you don't want to take action on data after 8 hours or 16 hours so uh, we believe that uh, the world is moving uh, from a batch based world to a streaming based world and if you think about streaming data replication then you know um, the ideal way to do it is using a technology called uh, change data capture so with change data capture uh, essentially uh, what products can do is they can detect any transactions happening at the source database which we call as a change and that change could be triggered as a result of insert update or delete and then we take the change we can transform the change and then you can figure out which platform you want to go in this case you know obviously we're talking about modern cloud data platforms like lakehouse you take it and you know transform the data or the transaction and you know place it there um, the beauty of change data capture uh, is that uh, it integrates data in live increments so you know it's all incremental instead so there's a tremendous benefit in your compute costs also and you think about a batch based job of 5 billion rows right you're going to write 5 billion rows every day from your on prem mainframes or netizas to to the cloud and instead of that you are just moving let's say 10% of the data every day so huge benefit in network transfer and compute speed and at the same time you get your data in the cloud in real time fresh and accurate so this stuff you know has a lot of benefits obviously right it gives you real time accuracy and all of it but you know at the same time uh, building these things are hard um, you know we are talking here about connecting you know databases and you know hardcore transactional systems like mainframes and you know complex data warehouses like netizas right so even if you want to build it in house you probably are looking at you know you know an engineering uh, developer team with you know very core database experience here right i mean these resources as soham mentioned right i mean do you really want to spend huge amount of dollars hiring those folks and building it in house just for your use case right um and the other challenge here is you know as you get into more and more sources and targets right these things only increase you know with scale right like if if you're okay, mainframe to lakehouse could be one pipeline you could have netizer to mainframe one pipeline you could even have oracle to you know uh, lakehouse or other pipeline so you know with pipe with more and more pipelines uh, this needs more resources to scale and all of that um, the second part which is very interesting is that you know because this is a 24 by 7 pipeline obviously you want to keep the replication on at all point because it's real time um, you also you know if you build in house there is a massive devops cost to it right and naturally you know uh, you 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 are looking at you know a couple of folks to just maintain it you know and again the complexity increases with sources and targets and again the biggest problem here on the business side is that you know this stuff is hard to build because it requires all this you know core database you know knowledge uh, you're looking at like a 12 to 18 months time frame for any working solution so you know there is a there is a huge benefit in you know not trying to build it in house and you know look at an enterprise solution uh, which can deliver this you know with the with the right properties i would like to uh, mention one more thing is that you know uh, there's a lot of confusion about what cdc is if cdc is not uh, what people think as incremental batch incremental batch snapshot is not cdc cdc is we the true cdc model at scale is what we call as event driven cdc it is extremely hard and costly to you know build event driven cdc and you know we encourage all our uh, listeners here to think about this aspect you know um, before trying it in house 
So I mentioned about, uh, you know, why this is hard and, you know, uh, why this requires a lot of database skills to build. So we, we put together, um, you know, uh, our ideas on what are the four pillars of what we think are, you know, should be, you know, uh, constituting a perfect enterprise CDC solution. And there have been platforms in the past which have, you know, uh, provided CDC solutions, especially from bigger vendors, but, those solutions, you know, uh, like, you know, Golden Gate or, uh, you know, even if you take off IIDR from IBM, were perfect in the previous non-cloud era. But in the cloud era, you know, things have changed completely, right? So what has changed? Uh, obviously, transactional integrity has existed for the longest time, right? You can't deliver a CDC solution without a zero data loss architecture or exactly once delivery. Low latency replication also has existed for a long time. Uh, you should have transactional uh, log-based application so that you don't put any pressure on the source database. You would want to do as much in-memory processing as possible to achieve low latency. But two things that have changed now in the cloud world, the first thing is scalability, right? In the cloud today, you have to offer a solution that is you know, having a distributed architecture that has every form of parallelism that is possible, interactable, intertable, scale up, scale out. You, know, you, you are you know, enterprises expect these features in the cloud world. The fourth aspect, which, you know, I think Suham touched upon and I touched upon is there should be, you know, an option to fully, you know, uh, have it fully managed in the cloud because you do, do not want to bother about maintaining the solution in a, you know, environment and all of that. So if you, uh, you know, if you have a workload that can be, you know, fully managed in the cloud, uh, you know, with the cloud makes it very easy for, you know, for any vendor to, you know, kind of do it. And I believe that the fourth pillar, which is a fully managed service is a very, very important thing in the CDC solution. Uh, when I go back to the previous generation of the products, none of them have been able to, you know, achieve that, you know, uh, the cloud-based, you know, uh, easy button, you know, self-service uh, option. So at Archeon, uh, you know, um, uh, we have built, uh, you know, we've been building it for the past four years. Uh, we, I, I spent 18 years in databases and then took a break from, you know, my database product um, uh, thing to build something that connects database. I felt the need for it, you know, in the past, you know, in my last uh, few years working for database companies that there's a, there's a need to, to do this. And we have thought about all the aspects that we talked about um, in the previous slide, which is, hey, um, you know, you build a low latency, fast, you know, data replication platform, but also something that guarantees, you know, uh, consistency and uh, reliability, you know, because we're talking about transactions and, you know, critical business data here, right? Um, I talk about uh, something that is super important, which is zero impact. So we have, you know, something called agent-based architecture, which means, you know, we do not run anything continuously as a side process or what we call as an agent, like some other vendors on the source database. So, you know, you are absolutely guaranteed that, you know, there's no security issue or anything like that. And fourth thing, which is, this is a zero code architecture. So, you know, you don't need a master's degree or a PhD degree to, you know, do um, start Archeon. And, you know, again, I'll talk about how we make it even easier um, for our users to, you know, do something on the cloud also. So this is one aspect I wanted to touch base upon, uh, you know, this has been my learning for the past two years that, you know, um, some vendors in our space, which are previous generation, or even, you know, newer, um, some, they are, some of their connectors are truly agent-based. And if you think about an agent-based architecture, um, you know, you're thinking about putting one process from a third party vendor to run alongside your database in your database server. And that can create a lot of you know, challenges. The biggest challenge is that you're running a process alongside the database server. So that process is going to compete uh, for resources like CPU and memory from your source database server. So you know, there, is, there is bound to be a degraded performance on the database side. And also there is a potential for getting a lower throughput on the replication side. That is not all. Other challenges, you know, you might have, you know, depending on what type of database you have, like you would have massive upgrade and, you know, downgrade issues because you would have to install the agent on all your database servers. So assume you have, you know, like 100 Oracle instances or, you know, 25 mainframe instances or whatever, right? 
So you would have to ask your DBAs and somebody managing the databases to manually install those and keep upgrading them over time, right? So there's an enormous complexity in agent-based you know, solutions, which we have identified. And then the other aspect comes about the security aspects, right? Uh, databases are critical, right? I mean, we all know it, right? You know, um, we have seen Equifax and other uh, systems where you know one bad actor close to the database, which was running as an agent, you know, uh, took out all the social security numbers, right? So we have to be really careful about in all of those aspects. So which is why we spent a lot of time in the past one year to make sure that you know Archeon becomes a hundred percent agentless solution today. Uh, no, take any source that we connect to, we have an agentless solution for that source. So which means zero security risk higher throughput replication, no admin costs, and an absolutely no performance impact to your source database. So this is one you know, area I would encourage you know, uh, the listeners here to you know, look at when they select a CDC solution. So I'll talk briefly about the CDC methods that, that we support. So we have log-based CDC, which is obviously the greatest and the best form of CDC, which look, leads you know, the redo logs uh, from an you know, OLTP database. And obviously, you know, we look at the logs, so we just need one time setup, you know, to, to uh, read the logs. Um, having said that, if this is the best one of CDC. Um, if you do not have a transaction log, which could happen, right? If you're talking about um, data warehouses like Teradata, where, you know, they do not maintain a typical transaction log uh, or Amazon Redshift, where, you know, you may not have a transaction log, typical warehousing systems, we also offer what we call as the, time-based uh, uh, you know, replication where you need uh, one timestamp column per table and the timestamp column needs to be updated on every modif modification. So this is something, you know, these are the two methods that we provide uh, to you know, all our users, OLT OLTP log-based, OLAP you know, time-based. Since we talk, uh, talked about a few IBM products, uh, you know, as part of the presentation earlier, I just briefly cover, um, you know, what, uh, what products we support. So we, we do, uh, you know, uh, CDC out of all database uh, products out of uh, IBM, uh, DP2, LUW, mainframe I-series, Z-series is something that we're releasing, you know, in a few weeks. And all of them are log-based CDC uh, and agentless architecture and all of that. And we support all the variants in data formats, right? You know, FCDA, COBOL, Copybooks, if you have these kind of flavors, you know, Archeon has all the necessary tools to convert, you know, and understand that those data formats are on the CDC. Uh, we also offer log-based CDC on another, you know, fair, popular IBM OLTP product called Informix. Uh, you know, we have several, uh, you know, uh, customers who use us on, on a daily basis for Informix. And NetEase, obviously, uh, we offer uh, timestamp-based uh, data replication out of NetEase. Uh, but especially in the case of NetEase, uh, even though I mentioned in the previous uh, slide that you need a timestamp per table, column per table, in case of NetEase, uh, that is not required. So you may have NetEase tables that do not have the timestamp column and will still be able to you know, offer a complete CDC product out of it. I briefly touch upon uh, the partnership between Archeon and Databricks. Archeon is, is a gold level partner with Databricks. We feature on Databricks uh, Partner Connect. So you could go to Databricks Partner Connect and spin up an Archeon uh, cloud uh, instance to move your data from other databases to um, Databricks. And this is a complete list of uh, all the databases um, that are available for you know, CDC. If, if you have a database, that does not show up on this, please feel free to communicate to us. You know, chances are that we are either building it uh, in the next in near future or you know, we'll spin up a project to, to do it very soon. I'll talk briefly about uh, three deployment options of uh, Archeon. Uh, we believe that infrastructure uh, should be made available to everybody, you know, um, whether it is self-hosted, whether it is cloud or whether it's in the, through our partner portals like Databricks, right? So you could run it on-prem, either on cloud, anywhere that you want, right? Depending on your, on your use cases. So I, brief, I mentioned about DevOps gains. So, you know, we have people uh, using our cloud product who didn't want to deal with any DevOps and, you know, um, they were thrilled with, with, with what they saw and you know, I encourage everybody to, you know, 
uh, try out our cloud product to kind of see you know how easy it is you know to 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 move data from you know other databases to you know um, databricks and other platforms that we support with that i will try i will shift uh, you know to the demo i hope you guys had a good understanding of the challenges in cdc and uh, you know right and what we'll do here today is we're going to show you transactional replication from a source db2 system to a databricks lake house what i've done is i have uh, set up a, a shell where i have started a replication uh, can you guys all see my screen here so i've started a replication and this has all been running and we have a seven or eight tables in um, the TPCA schema. As you can see here, I have already started the replication. This is in CDC mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some up, you know, uh, transactions, and then you know they'll all show up in in the lake house, you know, uh, within a minute or so. And this I will do some large uh, transactions here, right? Which is you know thousand rows of date, twelve hundred, you know, fifty five rows of date. So let's do this. Uh, let's go to the screen and see that you know we have a line item table here. 60,175 rows. Uh, we will go to uh, the data breaks here and we'll do a you know, select count star here. We'll just run it you know, uh, quickly and wait for the results here and just validate the row count that we have done. So it's 60,175. Then we go back to this screen. And then what we're going to do here first is we're going to take uh, you know, an update query on um, orders here which is going to update 1,255 rows. Okay. So we're going to take this and we're going to apply it in the DB2 system. Okay. Yes, second. Some. Uh, looks like it timed you out. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> uh, that's the demo gods, uh, you know. Yep, we know how we know, all know how those work. Yeah, just a second. Oops. Everybody, just a reminder while Raj is finishing that up, if you, have, if you do have any questions, uh, if you could please yeah. use the QA button. Let me set up the environment one minute. Okay. I just right, need to log in good. back to the DB2 thing. Not a problem. Thank you, Raj. All right. And we do have several questions. We are going to answer a lot of these questions in the QA session. So, you know, please be patient with us. We're answering, we're answering as many of the questions as we can. And then if we have more of them, we'll be sure to answer those, you know, in the QA. Yeah, one thing I found interesting, um, um, and this is like party answering some questions as well, is you can do like Archeon could be installed in the cloud, right? So they have a platform as a service, but you can even do it within your own VPC or VNet within your own system for the security conscious customers. So that's important. Yeah, we are back here. And, you know, this was not the demo, but actually this was our famous Zoom bar which made me click at a different place. So <laughs> I reconnected to DB2 here. So as you can see here, um, everybody, are, you, are we back on the screen? Yes, we see. Okay, go. perfect. So I, have, I just put an update here uh, with you know, um, 1255 rows. And you can see here that you know, we already updated, picked it up um, on the Databricks side. So you know, I'm going to repeat it again because I did it you know, while we didn't share the screen. So we just change it to like, something like demo 33, right? And we're going to run this again, you know, for, for our audience here. Um, so this is an update on order stable. Um, let's see. So we do this and we go to the DB2 thing and we do this again, right? So this is uh, an update again on order stable, um, which is, you know, 33. And I'm, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go here and to the, main screen and we want to see what happens here right so oops okay. 
So again, you see like, you know, we have buffered operations, which means the transactions have been picked up. So when we wait for the things to show up on Databricks, uh, we're going to do some more updates for, you know, to show that, you know, it doesn't work on one table, but multiple tables. So we're going to pick this. This is a line item thing. So we'll do one more. Uh, I'm just changing some strings, you know, here so that, you know, we know that it's, it's not something that I've tried earlier. So I'm going to pick this up now. Um, and these are all different tables, right? And all like, these are not like single rows update. Like they're all like touching thousand rows, 2000 rows, that kind of stuff, right? So we go here and we see that, you know, as you can see here, we have been picking up changes and, you know, some for order table, we've already picked up the change. Uh, and this is again, line item has been picked up super fast within a few seconds. Even for the other table, you know, the stuff is in memory. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update the others as well. So we complete the cycle of, you know, so I'm just trying to demonstrate here that, you know, this product works, you know, um, it's fully scalable, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, go and do updates on multiple tables and all of that, right? So I'm going to briefly show you on the Databricks site that the update has actually gone through, right? So we we'll look at the comment column of the orders table for this kind of form. So we go to Databricks here uh, and we are going to um, do this um, query. And I'm going to show you that the update actually has gone through. So this is a query that's, that we are running on the Databricks data break side now. Um, so as you can see here, the column table has been updated. The comment table uh, column has been updated to DB2 demo 33. So the update has gone through uh, everything in real time, you know, within a few seconds. So then, so we'll do some other operations here, delete and insert. But before that, I will quickly show you something, you know, so to connect. So the product is very simple. Uh, it's a zero code platform. Um, it's very easy to, you know, to connect. You have some YAML files to tell us how to connect to the database and, you know, all of that. Username, password here is in uh, plain text, but you can, you, can, you, you can give us, you know, encrypted files. You can connect through SSL and all of that. Uh, in the cloud, in AWS, you can use Secrets Manager and all of that to store your username and password. Um, the other thing is the product gives you the ability to select you know, files, uh, tables, and columns. So you can tell us, you know, I only need these tables out of all. And within a table, you can select, you know, uh, what columns you want. So you can filter out tables and columns. You know, it's not that, you know, we, we move everything to everything. So I'll come back and, you know, and then we have all the other good capabilities where you can, you know, resume and do all of that. Or you can stop a pipeline. And so I'll show you that, you know, we can also do other operations, which are deletes and inserts, which just not updates. And obviously, you know, insert is something that I guess, you know, the easiest to handle, but, you know, uh, we can do deletes as well. So yeah, what I'm doing here is, you know, region table has five entries. Uh, out of that, I, I have deleted now the first three, which value zero and two. Once I delete them, I'm, ins I'm going to insert them again, but let's go to the, you know, the screen and see. So as you can see here, uh, you know, the, the dashboard will will pick up the deletes as you can see here. You know, it's we have actually deleted the instantaneously on the Databricks side. So we'll go to Databricks side and you know we'll do select star from the region table and um, we'll run it and we can see it live. So, so as you can see here, the delete was almost instantaneous, which is a very hard operation. But again, you know, we are able to do it, you know, within a few seconds. Um, I'll go back and I'll try to what I will do is I'll insert the things. You know the the rows back again, and then we'll you know. Uh, okay, so that was all from my side on the demo side. I hope you guys could you know. Uh, sorry for the you know loss of connectivity. Um, as you can see here, you know we have a region table uh, two rows, and the other two rows are going to be populated you know very soon. That concludes my demo. Uh, you know. Oh, wow, that was pretty instantaneous. We just did the insert on DB2 and they showed up on the lake house, you know. So, you know, I demonstrated, you know, uh, five tables updates. I demonstrated delete on a table and then followed by an insert. And, you know, I, I hope you guys could see the real time genius of the platform, right? We were able to move data pretty fast. Uh, so that I, have, my, uh, yeah. I have a question. Right? Yes. So imagine thousands of tables, uh, CDCs going on. How do you manage and monitor that? 
uh, as an end user, how do yeah. they get status that it's all going well? Yeah, and great question. Not so, going well, how do you restart and so yes. on? So, um, so we have state man maintained everywhere. Um, you know, so we have a metadata concept of a metadata database, which obviously for the cloud users, you know, it's self managed. We have state for every table, how much, how much has read from the source, how much has been written to the target, and all of that is in a live dashboard. Uh, and then users can set up alerts. Uh, if there's a data inconsistency, they're going to get an alert. So we offer alert, alerts on email. We have offer alerts on new relic. You could actually configure, uh, you could you know, even attach Splunk or something like Grafana to get alerts. And every metric is maintained in our metadata database, even historical stuff like, hey, you know, over the past day, what has been the, you know, summary of um, insert, update, and deletes over a period of time. So anytime there's a problem, you'll get an alert. But one good thing about Archeon is that we are a self-recovering solution. So if, if there is a problem somewhere uh, because of HA, uh, inbuilt HA, and obviously, I talked about this earlier also. I think you cannot release a product now in the cloud era <laughs> without having high availability and self-healing, right? So we have all of those. So users actually don't have to bother about it unless it's a problem that requires user intervention. I'll give an example. So if you have a default value in, let's say, in mainframe, you know, mainframes accept a different default value than some other databases, right? and the data can't match, right? In those cases, we will ask the users to intervene. But in general, you know, source could becoming faster, target slowness, you know, network, intermittent network issues, all of those are automatically handled by Archeon today without any user intervention. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you have dashboard, you have metadata, if anything is down, you know exactly where to restart from. So your full recoverability, people don't have to worry about the problem of production support. Once yeah. Had. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, thank you both, Soham and Raj, for uh, joining us today and taking time out of your out of your day to discuss these topics with us. Um, with that, it's time for a little Q and A. So uh, give me a minute and let me see what kind of questions we have. We had quite a few questions come in. We answered a quite a few. And we have a few more. So uh, let's see what we have here. So the first question comes up. I think it's going to believe to to Ra or going to be for Raj. Uh, is your does your solution use log logs to create CDC feed uh, to create the CDC feed? Apologies for the butchering of the question there, but yeah, I, do we use me, logs? Yeah. So uh, Pushottam, thank you for this question. Uh, great question. So yeah, we we read the try to read the source transaction log to get the CDC feed. Uh, and you know, if it's an OLTP database like Oracle or MySQL or Postgres or whatever, right? Um, we we either would use some form of raw API that the database has already provided, or we you know we have solutions to kind of understand the log structure to create the CDC feed. I hope that 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 answers the question. Um, great, yeah, great. Okay, um, the next question is. Do we need any cloud schedulers to pull changes and push to a final target at the cloud? Or is this handled automatically for us? Um, Sunita, excellent question again. Uh, there is a form of scheduling that we provide already. Uh, you know, uh, you, could, you could configure our product to pull data you know, in real time, or you could, you know, we could pull the changes continuously and push the data to the cloud target. Um, you know, in specific intervals, we provide all those. However, you know, we are, you know, you could also take our product and, you know, run it with any other scheduler, you know, for example, um, Airflow is a great example here. You can use Apache Airflow to schedule jobs of our product. You obviously need to, you know, do the integration, which, you know, sometimes can be challenging, but we have so far not, you know, get pulling the changes and pushing to, Multiple targets at multiple intervals is something that we naturally provide uh, this kind of scheduling in our own thing. So to get started, unless there's an extreme form of you know, scheduling, you wouldn't require any cloud schedulers. Okay, great. 
Um, we had a couple questions related to agentless solution. Uh, I see one here says, uh, what is underneath the tech? Is it REST API calls or something else? They're, they're yeah. curious about the agentless solution. Yeah. How, yeah. how are we handling that? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Papadita. So um, it is agentless. Underneath the tech, it is you know, a lot of different you know, uh, things for different databases. We use different techniques for different databases. Most of the time, we would you know, want a, you know, uh, a, a copy or access to the transaction log files. So obviously, you know, you will need one time setup. Uh, in certain cases, we'll use some uh, APIs that the database uh, provides like mainframe, you know, use, you know, it's very well known mainframe has uh, raw uh, APIs for us to, you know, interact with the, with the journals and the, and the log files. So it's different for different databases. But uh, yeah, uh, we, have, we have REST API calls for very different purposes. You know, we have REST API support to start and stop replication. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to uh, program programmatically call, uh, you know, start a replication or end a replication, we have REST API for that. But uh, we don't use any REST API um, for our agent list thing. It's all, you know, handwritten, uh, very database specific, you know, ODBC and that kind of stuff here. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Raj. Uh, there was one question on um, on the TD, so I'd like to get so from Jian Li. Hey, Jian Li, quick question is uh, the quick answer is yes. We support the Oracle with TDB for any uh, Oracle source, you know. So we have actually customers in production <laughs> with TD. So you know, you can you can you can uh, rest assured that you know we handle all type of this. Uh, um, Let's see. Um, I, I all the config... Go ahead. I like this one question, Luke, which is by Sunny Sharma. Oh, so yeah, can we pause and resume CDC? Yes. While using integer and timestamp columns. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me answer Sunny Sharma's um, question. So, can we pause and resume CDC while using integer or timestamp column? Um, can we resume CDC process uh, stops unexpectedly? Whether you use log-based CDC or time-based CDC, uh, our pause and resume uh, uh, solution works out of the box. So yes, the answer is yes, we can pause and resume CDC when doing timestamp-based and you can resume CDC if the process stops unexpectedly. So you know this is inbuilt in our architecture and we will not lose any data there. Um, I'd like to answer one more uh, look before we get to the other one. So there's a question from okay. Manas. Uh, are all the configurations for CDC done by VS Code extension? Is there is a GUI? Manas, there is obviously a GUI. Uh, you know, uh, we, we offer a GUI for, for self-hosted as well as the cloud. But there is, you know, we have um, our CLI fans also, <laughs> uh, core DBAs and engineers who want to play around, uh, you know, and then, um, you know, call the things stuff to REST API call and all of that. So all options are there. Uh, I didn't cover GUI today, uh, but you know, there's a GUI option to, 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 to the solution also. Yeah, and Raj, if they spin up Archeon from Databricks Partner yes. Connect, it's all GUI based. Right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, thank you so much for mentioning that. Thank you. All right. I just use so, VS Code today to simplify my life. Generally, you can go to any Linux shell and you can start the product there. So it's very easy if you use our self-hosted uh, you know, uh, thing, then you can easily get it. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Uh, I think I, I'd like to answer one question on schema evolution here. I think uh, somewhere I saw that question um, from someone on schema evolution. Yes, we do support schema evolution out of the box. For a lot of sources, um, you know, um, and I think we are one of the few products today, and I would believe we are the only product today that actually does schema uh, evolution and DDL replication from other databases to Databricks, and I'm pretty confident about that part. Uh, and we also offer schema evolution for other source target combinations, but in the context of Databricks, we we definitely support it. If you have add a new table or you modify a column change a column, all of that is picked up and, you know, um, the change will be reflected on the Databricks site without any user intervention, you know. So, um, you know, you please try our product and all of that will work, you know, out of the box. Um, okay, thank you, Raj. Um, you just to just, let everyone know, yeah. I know we're getting close on time here. Um, if everyone would like to stay for the rest of the questions, we can, you can totally stay for the rest of the questions, but yes. I don't want to hold yeah. anyone because I know we're getting, we just yeah. now clicked over 
uh, on time. So um, for anyone else, uh, a couple of reminders for you. We'll be sending out a recording of, uh, of the presentation and also the presentation itself to all the attendees. And remember the winner of the Amazon gift cards will be announced and contacted via email. And last but not least, if you, uh, you know, if you have a need to move data, then give Archeon's, uh, uh, you know, solution to spin uh, either via via Databricks or uh, obviously you can reach out to us for our self-hosted solution if you feel that's more more your uh, more your speed or or fits your need better. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised how easy to set up and get going. And if it's not, you know, let us know. We're always open to feedback. So thank you all for your time and attention today. I hope we're able to provide you at least with with one answer to any of the questions you might have came here with today um, regarding the topics that were covered. Reach out with any additional questions that questions that might come up afterwards. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And that concludes the official webinar. So if anyone else wants to stay over for the actual extra questions, we can do that now. Thank you so much. All right, Raj, apologies. I didn't mean to cut you off there, sir. Yeah, no, I there's some weird lighting going on here. So you know that you did that. Yeah. Right <laughs> All right, let's see. Thanks, um, audience. Um, you know, I think great questions. I, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll obviously go back to each of you with your questions. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, it's, we saw some, I think we have a few more. I don't know. All right. Yes, we have a few more. So let's get to some of these like Pushottam, how does pricing works? The pricing for our product is per core. Uh, per core of our uh, part uh, on the machine that, that you are going to run replicant on and we can get go back to you know you uh, you know we can talk you specific about you know how much does it cost per core and all of that you know that depends on various factors right so um, Sarang had a question what artifacts are created from Archeon when in the migration as the persistent repo so Sarang I think this is something that you know I think we will we'll send you a detailed answer on email I think it's hard to answer that live uh, you know, uh, setup and deployment is very easy. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, so don't, don't, uh, you know, get bothered about, you know, uh, artifacts and that stuff. It's very easy to start our product. Uh, anonymous attendee has Archeon received an ATO for any federal agency. Um, we will respond to that on email. Uh, I'm not authorized to, you know, answer that uh, in a webinar. Uh, you know, we will definitely have somebody in the company respond to you. Uh, what is the elephant icon on VS left hand side? What extension? I just use VS Code to you know ease my life in the demo. We don't need VS Code to do this demo. So product is you know you can run the product in a shell and all of it you know so you know um, um, or, or even using a UI. Uh, Shibashish had a question. Do you have any data quality measuring APIs? Um, well, it depends on what you want in data quality. We actually have two 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 tools that we ship alongside the replication called the offline validation and online validation. So our validator tool, which runs, you know, as a separate process than the replication would periodically keep checking, uh, you know, about the data quality, whether, you know, the, the data from the source matches with the target and all of that, right? So uh, we have, you know, side products that are, that, that are available, uh, you know, along with the replication product to, to check for data quality. So yeah, um, answer to your question is, but you know, we don't do any statistical stuff and all of that, right? But we generally, we will definitely um, look at the quality of the data that, that we have moved. Uh, I guess we have I think mostly, that's yeah. most of them. Yep. Most, if not all. Uh, and again, if we didn't answer a question or you have other questions, you can always reach out to us or find us again on LinkedIn and also Twitter. So thank you so much for, for your time. And with that, we will end the webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.